We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Monday, June 16th at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. Ask the clerk if you would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Moffitt. And Councilmember Shule. We have uh, three presentations to make uh, this evening. The first uh, recognizes Parks and Recreation and I would ask uh, the director around the park if she would join me and anyone else that she'd like to bring. Uh, the resolution speaks to the fact that Parks and Recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country including the city of Durham, whereas Durham Parks and Recreation program is vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our city, ensuring the health of our residents and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of our city and region whereas Durham Parks and Recreation programs, including athletic, athletics, summer camps, special events, and outdoor recreation, build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who have mental, developmental, or uh, physical disabilities, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all residents, whereas Durham Parks and Recreation programs increase our community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction, whereas parks and recreation are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community, whereas Durham parks and natural recreation areas improve water, qu water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife, whereas Durham parks and recreation natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community, provide a place for children and adults to connect with our nature and re recreate outdoors, and whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, whereas the City of Durham recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreational resources. Now, therefore, I, William Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have I proclaimed July 2014 as Parks and Recreation Month in Durham, and hereby urge all residents to take special note of this observance by visiting our parks, participating in programs, and special events throughout this month. With this my hand in the Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 16th day of June, June 2014. I'd like to present this to Rhonda for any comments she might have. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Temp city council and city manager for acknowledging this national designation. Residents of Durham and colleagues, since 1985, America has celebrated July as Park and Recreation Month, the official. This rec recognition provides us with an opportunity to raise awareness in the Durham community about the value of parks, recreation, wellness, fitness, activities, and sports for the whole family. Did you know that Durham has held the Playful City USA designation by Kaboom? for the last six years, and that DPR is one of seven department, parks and recreation departments in the state of North Carolina that is nationally accredited. Also, I have to take this opportunity to recognize our Recreation Advisory Commission. They would stand. We have two of our representatives here tonight. We have Lauren Darden and Kathy Brennan. And of course, uh, Councilman Steve Shule is our liaison from the council. But they represent all residents 
in advising us in the master plan, community concerns, and support for community organizations. They are city council appointed and they attend community meetings, PACs, and volunteer at community events. We want to thank them for their efforts and for their hard work because we do work them hard. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about two three upcoming programs that you can take advantage of for the whole family. We have the Rock the Park concert movie series in the parks, and the cards are at the front table by the door, and this is what they look like. So please, it's something for the whole family. And also we have the July 4th at the DBAP, which is for the whole family. The uh, uh, activities start at 6 p.m. You can go on our website at www.dprplaymore.org. And also our summer camp started this today, and we'll be serving over 1,200 plus children in the city of Durham. So we hope that you'll come and check us out and enjoy and play more with DPR for this summer. Thank you. The Forensics Services Division of the Durham Police Department was officially accredited in the area of forensic inspection. Uh, this is a major achievement that in addition to the police department's recent reaccreditation by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies known as CALEA, in which the department earned the very prestigious gold standard. Angela Schuff, the Forensic Services Manager, is here tonight, and I'd like her to join me to acknowledge the staff who contributed to forensics accreditation and to explain how the achievement of forensic accreditation enhances public safety services. This is especially relevant to tonight's council meeting as accreditation requires additional forensic staffing to help ensure the quantity and quality of forensic processes. So I'll turn this over to Ms. Schuff for her comments. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager, the Police Command staff, and citizens. Without the continued support from all of you, we could not have achieved this major milestone. The Durham Police Forensic Services Division is the first crime scene unit and crime lab unit in North Carolina to achieve this particular accreditation using international standards of forensic inspection. Since I became supervisor of the forensics unit in 2006, we have had a plan to expand and improve forensic services in Durham. Our goal has always been to improve the quantity and quality of service to our customers. This accreditation certifies that in our area of expertise, which are latent print processing, latent print analysis, firearms and tool mark analysis, digital forensics examination, and crime scene investigation, we can offer top-notch performance to this community and help make Durham a safer place to live, work, and play. Our quantity and quality have already improved as evident in our latent section statistics. Since hiring a second latent examiner in January of 2014, the section has examined 8,983 new finger and palm prints and identified over 300 people, including 151 suspects. This is already a significant improvement over our numbers produced in 2013 where we had only one latent print examiner. The information produced by our division is given to the department detectives faster than ever before. By the end of 2014, we expect to significantly impact clear clearance rates for cases involving forensic evidence. The funding of our second supervisor position, as the mayor mentioned, is being voted on tonight is another instrumental part of our plan. This position will help manage the increased personnel and larger caseload, help us maintain our accreditation, and conform to state law. The criminal justice system and the citizens of Durham can be assured that the highest quality of forensic science is being produced here in the Durham Police Department. Lastly, and most importantly, I must recognize the fine division employees that work hard every day and have endured numerous policy and procedural changes additional administrative duties, and countless hours of training in order to achieve this accreditation. Some of them are here tonight, and I would like to recognize them. Um, we have Forensic Supervisor Allison Hutchins, Crime Scene Specialist Heather Madry, Crime Scene Investigators Andrea Hinesley, 
Courtney Gordon, Jeanette Covey, Joy Narowski, Hillary Sheaves, Tanisha Jones, and Jackie Horman. <laughs> we have latent print examiners, Lindsay Kincaid, Clinton Babb, our assistant, uh, Chief John Peter, and our Chief Jose Lopez. Um, thank you. <laughs> In particular, I'd like to recognize Forensic Supervisor Allison Hutchins. She serves as our accreditation manager, and she worked tirelessly for over a year to prepare us all for our site visit where the accreditation assessors inspect our workspace, examine our procedures, and interview our employees. Allison worked an average of 55 hours a week for most of that year, calling and visiting with other agencies, writing policy, and preparing staff for the accreditation process. I'm very proud of all of our employees. Their hard work and dedication to our customers is evident in their work product and ethic. When it's time to go home, they stay late to analyze that last piece of evidence, those last five fingerprints, or the three cell phones that may help to identify a victim or solve a case. Again, we thank you all for the recognition and the enduring support so we may continue to provide the best quality crime scene investigation and forensic casework in North Carolina. Thank you. Well, we certainly appreciate all the work that uh, you and your staff do for our city, and particularly, uh, I talked about the certificate of accreditation. Uh, you've seen it, but I just want to make sure the public sees this and the council sees it. Uh, it says the certificate of accreditation, ANSI-ASQ National Accreditation Board slash FQS, at 5300 West Cypress Street, Suite 100, Tampa, Florida. This is to certify that Durham Police Department Forensic Services Division at 505 West Chapel Hill Street, Durham, North Carolina, 27701, has been assessed by FQS and meets the requirements of International Standard ISO slash IEC 1720-2012 while demonstrating technical competence in the field of forensic inspection. Refer to the competing scope of accreditation for information regarding the types of inspections to which this accreditation applies. And it has a certificate number and is signed and is FQS approval. Uh, certificate valid 1016 2013 to 1016 2017. And it was issued October 16, 2013. And I'll present this again to Angela and uh, again for the public to see. In June of 2004, Durham One Call was created in the city manager's office and had the mantra, Durham One Call does it all. Ten years later, after answering thousands of calls and creating numerous service requests, Durham One Call is still doing it all, and then some. During this third week of June, Durham One Call is celebrating 10 years of service to the Durham community. Please join me in congratulating Durham One Call in this very significant accomplishment and I'm going to ask Marcel Brauner, the Durham One Call Manager, to join me in the podium to share some of the accomplishments of Durham One Call and some of the exciting events planned for this year. Marcel? Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Mayor Pro Tem and City Council members and our esteemed colleagues. My name is Marcel Brauner, and I am very, very pleased to say that today and beginning this week, Durham One Call is celebrating its 10th service anniversary with the city. And before I go any further, I'd like to bring up the team. Please come. We have most of the team that is joining us. And many of you may or may not know. Many of you may not know, but we have, of our team, we have four members that have been with One Call from its inception. So we have just a brief snippet that we'd like to show, um, a video. A video. <laughs> That's so cute. 
on Durham One Call. You have questions about City of Durham services? Can I pay my water bill online or by phone? Where do I report a pothole? How do I report a missed garbage pickup? Durham One Call does it all. Serving the city for over 10 years. 919-560-1200. Durham One Call is responsive to the needs of residents by reducing the number of non-emergency calls to 911, decreasing the volume of incoming calls to departments, increasing productivity within the departments, and improving accountability. Listen to what one Durham resident has to say. Well, I would say that Durham One Call is to me, it's a connector between the citizens of Durham and the city employees who are eager to help maintain Durham as an exceptional place to live. Call and speak with a well-trained contact center representative who will answer your questions or direct a service request to the appropriate department. Durham One Call has technology to better monitor city services performed by our department. Durham One Call is open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday except holidays. There is also an online service request form that allows you to request services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To help those who visit City Hall, a Durham One Call representative is located in the lobby. Bilingual English-Spanish speaking representatives are also available to provide assistance. Our mission is to serve the community through outstanding customer service. Who you gonna call? Durham One Call does it all. <laughs> all right, so you kind of got a little snippet about what goes on with Durham One Call. And what I'd like to share with you is that from 2004 to June of 2014, we have serviced three million residents in the form of calls, service requests, or walk-in visitors into the lobby. And these individuals here have been the ones that have been key to that success in assisting the residents. Abdul Farrakhan has been with us from, the, from its inception. Edomira Palamo is a member of the team and been with us for some time. Arnetta Lee has been with us from the inception of the team. Mona Moore is the supervisor of the team. Jackie. Liggins, uh, yes, Jackie Liggins is a member of the team, and Ethel Blackwin has also been a member of the team from its inception. And so we, be, we are very, very proud and pleased to be able to serve the Durham community, and we have three bilingual representatives, and the option for you to access one call by pressing one for English, two for Spanish, three for pay your war or storm order bill by phone. So with that, um, we thank you for your time and we look forward to continuing to provide. Huh? No. Oh, and <laughs> uh, how could I ever do that? <laughs> and one more representative, Myra Holloway, the love of my life. Yeah. I couldn't <laughs> forget her. <laughs> so we thank you for allowing us to continue to serve and to provide superior service and support to the residents and stakeholders of this city. Thank you. Here are prior items, uh, first by the uh, city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, priority items this evening. Uh, first, uh, on the agenda, uh, a minor correction. Uh, agenda item number 33 uh, needs to be moved following agenda item number 32, that public hearing. Uh, agenda item number 36, which is the uh, CIP ordinance amendment, Riverside on the Eno failed development reimbursement. This is a supplemental item from uh, uh, addition to the, uh, the items you saw at the work session. And then finally, the uh, 
review and response regarding recommendations of Durham Human Relations Commission and Civilian Police Review Board regarding police department matters. Uh, I have added, a, or I have provided the council with a uh, memorandum in this regard uh, outlining the uh, procedures by which we will be reviewing and responding to those recommendations. And uh, that item has been uh, added uh, for the public record uh, to this agenda uh, as a part of my uh, priority memorandum. Entertain a motion on the city manager's priority items. So it's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I uh, recognize the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Uh, likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay, in that case, we will proceed with the agenda. I'm sorry. I apologize. Announcements by the council. Recognize the mayor pro tem, Councilman Moffitt, Councilman Katati, Councilman Brown, in that order. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work of Ms. Linda Bratcher. This is her last meeting with uh, the city council. She is retiring. Uh, after how many years in city government? Stand up, Linda. Yeah, stand up. Yeah, she please. has persevered. So it's now time for her. Yes, uh, so you've worked over 30 years in local government and so we applaud you for, for this. We will miss you and uh, of course you can't leave until we have a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Linda, for your service uh, to uh, the city. Yeah, I want to add my congratulations also. All of us come in contact with various members of the city government and city administration, but uh, the clerk's office is one of the departments that we probably have more everyday type contact with and certainly Linda is one of the key persons that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, exchange information ask for requests and uh, she she always takes it in, in stride no matter how harsh or how demanding it might be she takes it in stride now uh, Linda I, I appreciate that uh, you got another comment uh, I Mr. Davis and I attended the prayer visual um, this, this afternoon, uh, stop the violence, and uh, we were pleased to see the uh, morticians, um, a part of that, especially those from uh, Fayetteville. Uh, they sincerely prayed for this city, and those of you who believe in prayer need to pray for it too. I know I will. <coughs> pray for peace and understanding among people and um, I thank them for carving that time out for us. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I uh, wanted to ask a question and then make a statement. The question I wanted to ask has to do with the city manager's priority item. It's not in the normal flow. Uh, will there be opportunity? I know there's some people that are. I, I apologize, Don. I was it's asking the city manager something. Could you just. Yes, I was just going to ask if, um, if there's an opportunity for citizens to comment on the manager's priority item regarding the memo. Uh, let, let, me, let me do this. Uh, I, I, want, I want to be clear, at least from the mayor's viewpoint. Uh, this is not a public hearing on this item. Uh, we haven't heard, the, we've received the report. Uh, I think the public needs to hear it. And then at the proper time, uh, we might recognize persons. But I, this, is, this is not going to be a public hearing on this. We've had the public hearing. The manager's first phase is to present his timetable. And I think there's going to be ample opportunity for the public to comment on what of the manager's report is back to the council. So if persons have signed up, uh, I'm just going to take a point of privilege and try to decide how we get responses to what the manager said. And I, I appreciate your, your raising that point, but uh, this isn't a witch hunt. Uh, we, we've gotten a lot of input on this piece a lot of input on it and we respect everyone that has taken the time to comment when we're going through the human relations commission report and uh, as i said you're going to have ample opportunity at the proper time when the manager presents his final report to have comments also 
So let, let me deal with that when when he, when he gets to it. I recognize uh, Councilwoman Katani. I'm sorry, I did have one more thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to um, also acknowledge Councilman Davis, who, who's been getting around an awful lot, because I saw him on Friday at the dedication of the Habitat for Humanity Homes, and I saw him on Saturday at the PAC-4 meeting and at the, um, at the open streets, the play streets um, over in um, Elm, Elmwood? Edgemont. Edgemont. I'm sorry, I just lost it there for a moment. And Councilman Shul was also at the, at the two latter events. It was just a great weekend. Uh, I think the most moving of that was the dedication of three habitat homes built in a single week by the members of the Home Builders Association and individual home builders. And I just wanted to acknowledge them for not just contributing dollars, but contributing their thoughts, their knowledge, and their time and their physical presence for a solid week. Thank you. Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to add my appreciation to uh, Ms. Linda Bratcher for all her tremendous years of service. She will be greatly missed. Recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to uh, thank and congratulate one of my friends and fellow colleagues on council, Steve Shule, who wrote a very fine and insightful piece in the, uh, the Durham News, hopefully some of you saw it, if not all, uh, concerning uh, where our tax monies go in terms of the, the many services that we provide uh, for our citizens. Uh, it, it's a piece worth, worth reading, particularly uh, tonight as we discuss the budget and hopefully pass it. Okay, any, any other comments? I have an observation that I should have made. Uh, but just like to observe that at our last work session, we were out in an hour and 22 minutes, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> just needed to make that public observation. <laughs> Are you implying that <laughs> Council Member Katati and myself perhaps are a bit long-winded, Mayor Pro Tem? Um, I, I repeat. <laughs> uh, we were out in 22 minutes. Was it 22 or 23 or 19? <laughs> Just an observation. Okay. Um, the first item uh, is the consent agenda. The consent agenda may be approved with a single vote. Uh, if a council member or member of the council asks for an item to be be removed, we we'll discuss that at the appropriate time. Um, and I'll just read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Item one is the Durham Convention Center Authority appointment. Item two is the Citizens Advisory Committee appointment. Item four is the Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board appointment. Item five is the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointment. Item six is the Durham Planning Commission appointments. Item 7 is the Durham City County Appearance Commission appointment. Item 8 is the Human Relations Commission appoint appointments. Item 9 is the FY 2013-2014 amendments to transportation grant project ordinances. Item 10 is fiscal year 2014-2015 budget and 2015-2020 capital improvement plan. Item 10 is pool. Uh, item item 11 is amendment to Durham City Code section 4622 regulating the position posting of a prohibition against carrying a concealed handgun on city recreational facilities repeal of Durham City Code sections 46-23 through 46-27 containing regulations of dangerous weapons and Item 11 is being pulled also. Item 12 is updating procedures regarding emergencies. Item 14 is the Second Amendment to Workforce Investment Act contract between the City of Durham and Educational Data Systems Incorporated. Item 15 is contract amendment with Community Part Partnerships, Inc. to provide Workforce Investment Act Youth Framework Services from July 1, 2014 to June 30, 2015. 
Item 16 is contract amendment with Achievement Academy of Durham to provide Workforce Investment Act Youth Program Element Services from July 1, 2014 to June 30, 2015. Item 17 is agreement with Self-Help Ventures Fund for streetscape enhancements to ad adjacent portions of West Chapel Hill and Kent Street and amend the 2013-2014 budget ordinance. Item 18 is contract for city services and programs for downtown Durham Municipal Services District FY15. Item 19 is FY15 agreement to fund downtown Durham Inc. for city economic development programs. Item 20 is bid report for April 2014. Item 21 is construction manager at risk contract with Belfer Beatty Construction LLC for city hall annex and building envelope project. Item 22 is radio equipment building construction change order and additional professional services. Item 23 is benefits consulting and broker services evaluation and recommendation selection. Item 24 is license agreement of MJM Gateway Terrace Re LLC. Item 25 is utility extension agreement of Daniel Bentley to serve 7001 Herndon Road and that's sewer only. Item 26 is contract amendment for ST257 Carver Street extension. Item 27 is 2014 street repairs and repaving project ST269 contract award. Item 28 is supplemental agreement for safe routes to school project near Federal Street Elementary School. Item 29 is Southeast Pressure Zone elevated water storage tank contract. Construction contract award to landmark structures ILP. Item 30 is contract amendment number two with Triangle J Council of Governments to complete expanded scope of tasks and supplemental article number six for the Jordan Lake Partnership. Items 31 through 32 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as a public hearings. Item three is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 35 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. I uh, entertain a motion for the acceptance approval of the Consent agenda items with exception of item 10 and item 11. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. If we go to the general business agenda, major site plan for New Hope Church building and parking addition D13003. Oh, I'm sorry. Item 35 is an amendment to <laughs> Durham City. Code section 38-21, regulating the possession and consumption of alcoholic beverages in public buildings and parks. Mr. Mayor, members of council, the, this item was brought at the uh, request of, of individuals who wanted to have a, a, a meeting that included uh, alcoholic beverages on the uh, lawn of a particular building, the McCown Mangum House in Eno Park. Uh, we have made changes to the ordinance um, as stated in the agenda item uh, to make it consistent with some other uh, buildings that we have in city parks where alcoholic beverages are allowed to be consumed uh, on the lawn of a particular building. Uh, I do want to just remind uh, council and the public that uh, this doesn't uh, mean that you can just go into a park and consume alcoholic beverages. It has to be done with a permit. Um, it just uh, clarifies where you can have um, alcoholic beverages with the permit and, and we've made those changes in accordance with the council direction. Any discussion on the city attorney's comments? No, I didn't entertain a motion on item. Move the item. Uh, we've had a motion and a second. You can come up now, Ms. Peterson, and hold it for the discussion. You have three minutes. I'm Mrs. Peterson, Victoria Peterson, and I'm one of the political activists here in Durham. Uh, I also work heavily with our men and women in this community who have committed crimes. And one of the things I want to share with the public, I want just to remind all of us, is that this community already has so many places that sell some form of alcohol that is really, really out of control. If you look at the statistical information that the police department has, many, many of their arrests involve some form of alcohol. 
many violent crimes in our community involves some form of alcohol. And matter of fact, several murder cases that I was heavily involved with in this community involve some form of alcohol. We need to be very careful in this community. We have a lot of people moving in this community. We have a lot of our young children, our young people, our teenagers that are getting hold to drugs and alcohol. If we continue to allow every place in Durham to sell alcohol, we are putting a lot of our citizens in danger. So if we're going to now to allow, to allow alcohol to be served in our parks, then we really, really need to make sure that people who are gonna be coming into these parks really do have permits. Personally, I don't see why. Why is it that we have to serve alcohol in the parks? Uh, I think it should be a no-no. But I just want our community and our leadership in this community to just be very careful. We continue to talk about crime and that we wanna get a handle on crime but some of our citizens, when they do drink alcohol, they really get out of control. I feel sorry about that. We don't want to control adults. But when you see danger, you have to say something about it. And I'm saying, and I have been working with a lot of our young folks that are in the jails, some in the prisons, and like I've said, I have been involved with several murder cases, and if I mentioned the names, you would know, even to the point dealing with the Duke Cross situation. And none of us want to talk about that. But that also was young people that got a hold of alcohol, even though they were not supposed to. Many of them were underage drinking, and it cost this community millions of dollars to deal with that. So I'm just asking our city council and my citizens for us to please be very careful about continuing to approve so much alcohol in this community. Thank and you, beer. Ms. Pease. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Quite welcome. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote? It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. We move to the General business agenda public hearings. I was looking at this new old church piece. 31. Public hearings on the proposed economic development incentive agreement with reinvestment partners. Mr. Mayor, members of council, city manager, city attorney, good evening. My name is Grace DeGenio with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. I'm speaking to recommend an agreement, an economic incentive agreement with reinvestment partners. On April 21st, 2014, the City Council approved an economic incentive policy amending the earlier policy approved on April 4th, 2011, which included the Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Incentive Program. Projects to be funded through this program are intended to accomplish the following to stimulate economic revitalization by leveraging private investment, to create and retain permanent full-time livable wage jobs, to make permanent jobs accessible to lower income neighborhood residents, including persons who are unemployed, to engage community investment and support, to strongly encourage local partnerships, to complement other neighborhood initiatives, projects and programs, and to leverage other funding resources. In order to be eligible for an incentive payment under the Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Incentive Program, the capital investment must be made with the community development area outside the downtown tier. The project should have a sustainable impact on the physical economic vitality of the affected neighborhood in which it strengthens the city's tax base in the area. The maximum incentive award may be up to 50% of the total investment made for a total incentive payment, but not to exceed 500,000. The policy is performance-based. No incentives will be paid to the company until after the company has, has uh, achieved the terms of the economic incentive agreement. 
Reinvestment Partners has applied to OEWD, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, for a neighborhood revitalization grant incentive in support of its proposed expansion with the CED outside the downtown development tier. Reinvestment Partners is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advocate for economic justice and opportunity for advocating change in lending practices of financial institutions and to promote wealth building of underdeserved communities. In addition to advocating, Reinvestment Partners has been actively engaged in the redevelopment of East Gear Street neighborhood through commercial revitalization at 110 East Gear, 1201 North Roxborough, and 836 North Mangum Streets. Reinvestment Partners proposes to renovate an underutilized building at 902 North Mangum Street, which is a gateway corridor heading into downtown Durham. The plan is to develop is to redevelop a 4,500 square foot building into a food hub. The food hub would be an aggregation, distribution, and retail outlet that would be linked to excuse me linked together to house community organizations a local farmer aggregator, and also small businesses. The following amenities will be provided, will be provided. Office space for nonprofit community service agencies, spaces for cooking demonstrations and culinary education, dry storage for nonprofits, certified kitchen facility for food processing businesses, 800, 850 square feet of walk-in cold storage space, 150 square feet of freezer space, and a cool packing room for producing, sorting, and packing. The primary beneficiaries of the proposed food hub will include new and existing social entrepreneurs, populations with limited access to healthy food, and local farmers. The food hub itself initially will have, a five, will have five jobs that will relocate to the neighborhood. The project, when completed, will stimulate new business development in Durham residents in the targeted commercial area. The reinvestment partners proposal was recommended for funding based on its alignment with the goals and objectives of the Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Incentive Program. The grant program is supported by the RKG Neighborhood Assessment Plan of March 2006, which supports this type of grant incentive program. A major majority of the city of Durham is increasing, priority of the city is increasing and strengthening the economic stability of the, of the city. Staff endorses this project, which will serve to promote the continued revitalization and vitality of the downtown Durham and surrounding neighborhoods. The project will, com will be completed and will stimulate new business development for Durham residents in the area. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development recommends that City Council authorize the City Manager to execute an Economic Development Incentive Agreement with Reinvestment Partners in an amount not to exceed $100,000 for a building renovation project at 902 North Mangum Street. The City Council may reject the recommendation or may choose to fund the project at a lower amount. Not funding the project would be inconsistent with the mission of the Neighborhood Revitalization Grant Program in the community development area. The proposed project will have positive impact on the appearance and business climate in the East Gear Street neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report out, ask first other comments or questions by members of the council on this proposal. If not, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing matter. Uh, no one had signed up, but still persons that might want to speak. Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter is back before the council. Oh, yeah. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, the next item is item 32, New Hope Church Transportation Special Use Permit, case T14-000001. Uh, this hearing is, in this matter, is judicial in nature and will be conducted in accordance with special safeguards. Uh, witnesses must be sworn in and they are subject to being cross-examined and written evidence must be formally offered. Uh, persons who wish to testify, 
Okay. Persons who wish to testify should have signed up on the special sheet for this hearing at the clerk's station. Uh, people who are testifying, including city staff, should now go to the clerk's station, be sworn in to give your affirmation, and then return to your seats. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before the city council regarding this special use permit will be the truth, the whole truth, so help you God? Okay, let me ask now, do any council members wish to withdraw because they have a conflict that would prevent their deciding this case in a fair and impartial manner? Uh, let the record reflect that no council members acknowledge that. Uh, before we begin, I would like the attorneys for the applicant and for opponents or for representatives from each side, if there are no attorneys to come to the microphone, identify yourself to the council and take a seat in the front row. Uh, if an attorney or representative wishes to cross-examine a witness, no, it's this front row here, I'm sorry. If a if an attorney or representative wishes to cross-examine a witness, please raise your hand immediately after the witness has testified, and I will recognize you. All written information, including maps you want to be considered, should be officially submitted as evidence. Uh, copies of evidence you want to have admitted, with the exception of the staff report and attachments, should be given to the city attorney to my left and also to the other side. Each side may raise objections to admission of evidence on the basis of hearsay or other grounds. Questions concerning admissibility will be handled by the city attorney. And please do not hand anything directly to council members until it's first been reviewed by the city attorney and has been admitted as evidence. And we'll first hear from the city staff who have studied the request and then from the applicant and then from opponents to the application. Uh, with that, I'm opening the presentation of evidence and we'll now hear from the city staff. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Uh, first, I would like to ask that the staff reports and all attachments be made part of the permanent record. And I would further like to note that the required notifications have been met for this case. Um, the case before you this evening is a request from New Hope Church Incorporated, um, and they are requesting approval for a transportation special use permit for traffic impacts associated with a proposed expansion to their place of worship at 7619 Fayetteville Road. The development includes an existing 826-seat place of worship. A 750-seat expansion is proposed for a total of 1,576 seats. A TSUP is required for site plan projects that generate at least 600 vehicle trips in a single peak hour. The cumulative impact of a 1,576-seat place of worship exceeds this threshold um, generating an estimated 961 trips in the Sunday peak hour. A traffic impact analysis was prepared by the applicant's traffic consultant, VHB Engineering. The TIA has been reviewed by both the City of Durham Transportation Department and the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Staff has recommended that the applicant provide a copy of the approved TIA to be inclu included in the permanent record this evening. The review memos evaluating this analysis and identifying improvements required for approval of this TSUP are seen as attachments five and four. The Durham Board of Adjustment at their May 27th hearing um, approved the use of a place of worship associated with this request. In order to approve the TSUP, the council must find that the applicant has provided sufficient evidence to meet the four required findings um, staff is available and the applicant is also in attendance for any questions you have as well as the city transportation staff. Thank you. Let me ask our, from the council, are there any questions that either you might have of the city staff in their report? Recognize Councilwoman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, can you tell me more about the 210 linear feet of gap sidewalk remaining? I wasn't very clear on that in the memo. Bill Judge with Transportation. Uh, along the east side of Fayetteville Road, 
Um, the site is building, has existing sidewalk. They're constructing some additional for the expansion area, the additional parcel that they picked up. Um, they're subdividing that out of a larger parcel, which will leave about a 210 foot gap to the existing sidewalk to the north and the further neighborhoods. And um, do you know um, who that surrounding property owner is and if any contact has been made by the applicant with them with the intention of trying to fill that gap? I do not know who the current property owner is or if the applicant has contacted them. They are acquiring a portion of that property for this use. Maybe when the applicant speaks, we could hear from them on that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions by members of the council? Uh, if not, we will now hear from the applicant. Uh, the applicant may go to the podium to the right. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. My name is Jay Ferguson. I'm an attorney here in Durham. It's my privilege and pleasure to represent New Hope Church before the board and the city council. The first thing I would like to do is move for admission into evidence uh, for the board two documents which I believe have already been provided to the city staff. One is the traffic and impact analysis uh, which the, the staff had recommended to be made part of the permanent record as well as the transportation management plan if I may approach. Bring that to the city attorney. Mr. Ferguson, is this attachment five um, that's in the agenda? I actually think the traffic transportation management plan. I just want to make sure the, that staff has, has seen this document. I, uh, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Yes, the staff has seen that okay. document before. And this, uh, this is uh, admitted without objection. First, I'd like to address uh, Councilmember Katati's question through uh, Robert Schunk. The site plan submittal included uh, two parcels of land, one owned by New Hope Church, a second one owned by um, a partner uh, uh, entity. The, um, the intent was not to uh, build the sidewalk along the entire frontage due to some constructability reasons. In the future, when New Hope Church provides an expansion on that site, they would then extend the sidewalk further north to the, uh, to the other church that's located further to the north. Does that answer your question? Um, I guess uh, I'd just like to hear from staff if they concur, and it's really just a question of timing and phasing. So you're saying when the expansion, if approved, is does go forward, that gap will be filled? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Staff does actually concur with the applicant's representation here. The property to the north actually has a single family, or excuse me, a residential structure on it uh, that pre-exists this development. Uh, we readily acknowledge that at some point the church more than likely will expand their, 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 their uh, services and functions to that property at which time a, si a sidewalk will be required. Essentially we intend to rely on the documents that have been presented. I do want to point out that the net effect of this is simply about 457 vehicle trips during Sunday peak hours is what the special use permit is for. Uh, the, the recommended conditions of approval through the transportation management plan are two mitigation measures which the, the church is already doing, the use of a traffic control officer as well as internal uh, church personnel for internal circulation of the parking lot and we concur with uh, the staff's findings with respect to that and ask that that be made condition uh, of approval. I will offer Lyle Overcash and Mr. Schunk to answer any technical questions the uh, city council may have. Other than that we intend to rely on the documents that are presented or if the, if the board has any questions for me. Are there questions by the council? If not, uh, we have others who have signed up to speak. Uh, they, were, they signed up, uh, Mr. Overcash and Mr. Schunk, only to answer any questions that uh, the city council may have. Some others are here for another item involving New Hope Church should questions arise with respect to other issues. But other than that, for, with respect to the traffic, uh, Mr. Overcash is the traffic engineer. Okay, let me uh, at least acknowledge for the record that there's David Burnoff, uh, David 
Surge and Robert Shump with others that had signed up uh, for supporting the request. Uh, are there any other questions that council has of the applicant or any other members of, of the staff on this item? If not, uh, I'm going to assume that concludes all the testimony on this particular item. Uh, I'll turn it back to the staff for any comments. Staff has no additional comments other than we recommend this case for approval. Subjects, uh, I'm sorry, subject to the conditions as noted um, in the staff report. The options for the city council are approval as presented, approval with conditions as stated on the staff's recommended decision. Uh, we can deny that permit with a direction that the administration prepare a decision for denial with supporting reasons for the next council meeting, or we can continue this item to a specified time later in the meeting. Uh, I would ask, are there questions or comments on the council staff have any more that it wants to recommend or comment on? Steve, do you have any other comments on this item? No, sir. In, in that case, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion for one of the four motions that I indicated from the staff. There's a motion to approve the staff recommendation. There's a second to it. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to call a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 0. Okay, we'll go back. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I Sorry. do need you to take one additional action involving the uh, order um, to approve the order as drafted by staff. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, any further discussion on that item? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. We can go back now to item 30, 33, which is a major site plan for New Hope Church Building and Parking Edition D13-00344. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. This item is a major site plan request by Stewart Engineering on behalf of New Hope Church for a 27,034 square foot addition with additional parking to an existing 33,000 uh, 900 square foot place of worship located on approximately 35.3 acres on the east side of Fayetteville Road. The site is zoned rural residential and located in the Falls Jordan B protected watershed area. The site plan has been reviewed and determined to meet all applicable unified development ordinance standards for this type of use, including the approval of both a minor special use permit from the Board of Adjustment, which was approved in May of this year, and the transportation special use permit, which Council just approved. Staff is recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, you've heard the staff recommendation and questions by council members of the staff report. Here and on, entertain a motion on the item. I recognize. Okay, no, there aren't any speakers signed up. You, you have a question? Uh, Councilman Shule and Councilwoman Cantati. Mayor, um, I'd actually like to hear from representatives of the. Um, of the church on this, if possible, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's been. Uh, concern in the past about noise in the sanctuary. Uh, this is going to be, I assume now, a much larger sanctuary that uh, the neighbors nearby have had. Uh, there's been conflict about noise, and um, it's been a problem uh, for the people that live nearby across the tobacco trail, and I'm, I was wondering if you all could address that. I'll be glad to address it. I'm Jay Ferguson again from New Hope Church. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Shule how, what level you want of, of uh, detail because with me is Norrell Stewart who is an acoustical expert who has been involved in inter integrating sound uh, measures within the, the, the church planning. Uh, but in a nutshell, what's going to happen is this, is this is the solution to any issues that are out there. Uh, the, the, the worship center where noise has been escaping uh, the facility is going to be uh, encapsulated all the way around with another row of offices and there's additional uh, sound barrier through a drop down ceiling uh, in, incorporated into this expansion. I'll offer uh, 
Dr. Stewart, I don't, don't see him, if he could step forward, he has signed up to speak and he can answer any questions you have with respect to that. I don't know that the... I will, I'll, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I will say that this was fully vetted before the Board of Adjustments uh, for their issuance of the special use permit. I don't know, sir, that your technical expertise would be particularly helpful to me because I probably wouldn't understand what you had to say. Uh, but I appreciate your offering yourself here. Uh, but uh, I just, I'm interested, I guess, at a more general level, uh, d are you offering assurances that this is going to be significantly less loud than, than had previously uh, been the situation? I, absolutely. If you, if you don't mind, if Dr. Stewart could talk for just a moment. Okay, with the mayor, it's fine. Good evening, Norrell Stewart, Stewart Acoustical Consultants from Raleigh. Yes, we've been working with the uh, church over the last couple of years on this issue. Their new plan, while it expands the size of the auditorium for worship, it, in, it encircles that space with a row of offices and a corridor between those offices and the uh, space, uh, except for one small area right behind the stage where they do have an, out, an outlet to the outside. Uh, that area behind the stage will get a new, much higher performance door than the one that is there now. Uh, and the door will be further from the stage than the one that is there now. The other major thing that we addressed was uh, leakage out through the roof. The original roof area over the original area, we're putting in a gypsum ceiling, a sheetrock ceiling, uh, 22 inches below the roof with uh, three layers of gypsum in it. The new part of the roof over the new part of the worship space where it's expanded will not only have that ceiling, but we will also beef up the roof structure itself. And also around all of this, uh, for about 70% of it, the roof of the surrounding offices and uh, area extends up about six feet or so higher than the roof of the worship space. So it acts as a barrier to help prevent sound going towards the nearest homes. And we're confident this will drastically reduce the sound that's been heard. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And appreciate y'all working on that. I know it's been a big concern of the neighborhood, so thank you. Recognize Councilwoman Katardi. Thank you, Mayor. I had the same questions regarding I'm noise sure. concerns. And um, I do appreciate all the additional uh, structural um, pieces and I hope that will in fact go a long way towards addressing any concerns I guess my questions I would have felt more comfortable if there were representatives from the neighborhoods here tonight to say that they also feel comfortable I expected to see more folks I guess my concern would be about any commitment to resolve any issues that may arise in the future because I think the last exchange was not as congenial or cooperative as we would have liked and it dragged on for quite some time. So if for any reason the noise was, did present a problem, how would you all um, propose to address that and give us assurance and the neighbors assurance that they would be resolved in a um, mutually agreeable way? Well, first of all, the neighbors through their council, the, when I speak of the neighbors, I'm speaking of the ones that were involved in litigation. Those are the only ones that I can speak Board. Uh, they they are represented by council. That council has been aware all along of these plans. The plans were submitted to their lawyer. Uh, neighbors were present at the board of adjustments and spoke in favor of the expansion. Uh, they they too have an acoustical expert who I believe has also looked at the plans. And everyone, I think I can say everyone feels confident that this is going to resolve the issue. The you know. It's, it's hard for me to speak for what happens in the future uh, because we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I, I can tell you that uh, we have been very open with uh, the neighbors through their lawyer of, of exactly what we were doing, exactly what the expa expansion plans are, and he has never voiced any objection to any of the plans. And I, I expected someone to be here from the neighborhood to speak, uh, but they're not. They, they spoke in favor of the Board of Adjustments. Just one additional comment is that really we don't 
no one likes to see things go to litigation. I know it keeps you guys employed, and that's all well and good. But um, I've got two daughters in college. I know so. that. I know that. I appreciate that. But um, I, you know, we don't want it to go there. We don't want it to come back to us. We just want to be sure that everyone's perfectly content. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Mayor? No. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Recognizing Mayor Pro Tem. Is anyone here from New Hope? Um, I just want to thank you for the impact that you're making on the lives of young people. I know several people who attend your church, uh, young and not so young, and they are just marvelous citizens. And so I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much. Again, the entertain a motion on an item. It's been properly moved. Properly moved and second. Uh, any further questions, discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, let's go to the supplemental item um, 36. Uh, Zip Ordinance Amendment Riverside on Eno Phil Development Reimbursement. Is someone presenting that? Robert Joyner uh, with the Public Works Department of Development and Review. And I'm here presenting the uh, supplemental item, CIP Ordinance Amendment, Riverside on the Eno Failed Development Reimbursement. Uh, between 20, uh, 2009 and 2011, Public Works correct, collected the construction and stormwater facility agreement securities on Riverside on the Eno after the original development left the subdivision incomplete. Uh, we completed the streets in 2012 with the city's resurfacing contract with money from the failed development, no public funds were expended on, no, no city tax dollars were expended with the completion of that work. I'm here to discuss tonight with amending that because we have a developer who is capable of finish, finishing the remainder of Riverside on the Eno with the stormwater facilities. Uh, that'll be completed with the remainder of that money, $74,985 and that will be completed again with no city taxpayer dollars just with developer securities that have been collected on that and that would actually bring riverside on the eno completely back to life the remaining subdivision lots would able to be completed and again at no cost to the citizens or the city i've heard the staff report on this item questions comments recognize councilman katati councilman moffitt Mayor, at the appropriate time, I'll move the item, but first I wanted to just um, offer our appreciation to staff. I know you've worked tremendously hard on this, and you are doing a great job and saving the city money, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'd also like to thank city staff for helping me move this item very quickly. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. It's just what she said. Good. Uh, that being the case, entertain a motion on the item. Been properly moved second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you very much. It passes seven to zero. Um, let's go back to the items that have been pulled. And the first item was item 10. And let, let me say on this item, this is the budget. I know Councilman Shule pulled that item. We have one person that has signed up to speak on that item also. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask that the item related to item 10B, uh, no, item 10D, to adopt an ordinance to change municipal solid waste disposal commercial load fee schedule part 14-101 and to change solid waste yard waste collection fee schedule part 14-106 be severed from the rest of the, the budget items and uh, to have discussion on that item and take a separate vote on that. Uh, having said that, I'm going to recognize Councilman Shule. Is there someone else that wanted to speak on the council? I know someone, in, if not, rec before we pass it over here. Okay, I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I guess so. I, I want to ask then, 
I mean, what I'm interested in is just what you separated, 10D. Are we talking about that now, or are we going to talk about the rest of it first? Uh, I was yielding to you. You raised the point, so okay. you, however you want to do it. Sure. Uh, well, at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to make a motion for uh, option one uh, for the budget uh, for the for the uh, agenda item uh, that uh, has been given to us by the administration. Um, I, just without belaboring the point, we've had enough discussion about it, I think, but uh, I, I believe we ought to be replacing the solid waste fee uh, with a, a property tax that raises the equivalent amount uh, simply for the reason that uh, this fee, in my opinion, is regressive. It, the owner of a $75,000 home pays the same amount as the, as the owner of a $500,000 home for this fee. Um, and by my calculation, anyone with a home valued at less than in the area of $370,000 will be better off paying the extra in the property tax versus the, um, versus the fee. And I think if we're going to uh, have the kind of uh, economic fairness that we want if we are going to try to contribute to ending poverty uh, then let's let's be uh, taxing the let's 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 be uh, charging people uh, who have the least uh, the least amount of money uh, and I, as I say I think that we ought to be replacing the fee with the property tax for that reason mr. mayor thank you Thank you. I recognize anyone else who wants to speak on this item. I recognize the mayor pro tem. I have a question sure. for uh, the budget manager, just for clarification. Now, um, it is my understanding that the solid waste fee should generate one point, somewhere around one point four million dollars. Bertha Johnson, As director of is. budget and management services. That is correct. Okay. Now, if it it, it becomes uh, added to the property tax, my understanding is that at least $100,000 of that has to be paid just for its collection. Is that? I'm not tip? sure I understand huh. the question. So 1% we pay the county. 1% would yes, pay the county. Yes, that is correct, 1%. Yes. And so how, how do we balance that? If the expectation is 1.4 million, we do an additional tax? We do not. We net that out of the total tax number. Okay. If that's your question, if I understand. I think the question, the question is, though, to generate $1.4 million in real money, we have to take generate into account the collection rate plus the uh, collection fee, which in essence means it's a little bit more money than the 1.4 million. We take that off. That is correct. And then we, the net is 1.4. That is correct. We charge it as an expenditure on in the solid waste fund, and the revenues would come in on the revenue side, tax revenue. Okay, so it is actually increasing tax more, more tax. The total needed to support yes, the fund. Is. That is correct. Now, next year, since we understand that the solid waste uh, enterprise fund is not supporting itself we will have to add another tax and we need more revenue does that mean that we will add another tax on the taxpayers to meet the the needs of the solid waste enterprise so based on our multi-year financial plan next year the shortfall is about eight hundred thousand dollars which is about 0.3 cents on the tax rate so we would at some point have to resolve that difference based on the projected expenditures and revenue. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm still struggling with, uh, with this. Well, my, not a real struggle because I, I understand that uh, this will, just adding this as a part of a property tax will only benefit actually the haves and not the have nots because most people do a standard deduction anyway. For me, um, last year we made a decision to assess the one hundred, the dollar and eighty cents, and it is just not adding up for me that this year we would go back and change that. That's does not appear to be a good management uh, tool for me. I'm just telling you based on where I am in my walk. Um, it, it, so, and, and in essence, 
You can delay a tax bill. You don't have to pay. If you don't have all your tax money in a given fiscal year, they can work out a plan with you. But with that dollar and 80 cents a month, it is a, it is a sure thing. And the needs of the solid waste department go on. I mean, it's just kind of hard to wait for year and year after year to get that money in. So I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to my uh, plan to, to vote uh, based on a good management decision that we made last year to keep the solid waste fee as it is. Uh, our peer cities uh, user fees are, we're, we're in sync with our peer cities as well. Um, and, and I do know that folk who cannot pay that fee as a part of their uh, monthly bill, we have money uh, set aside and DSS will help people who cannot afford to pay. So it's not, and, and, and the other piece of that is, if you look at uh, property tax, if my house is worth 150,000, is assessed at $150,000, and my income is 25000 and I just happen to inherit a house, uh, somebody else has the same house assessed at the same fee, they're, uh, they're having to pay, they're paying uh, the same thing that I'm paying for that same uh, house, 150 I pay out for 25000 somebody else, 50000 they're paying that same fee for the same House, there's something wrong with that equity too. So I think we need to look at our tax system, period. Uh, this $21.60 is just not getting it for me. Uh, it would appear that uh, it's easy for even a low income person like myself to spend $1.80 a month rather than tag that on to another tax bill. Uh, that uh, is not designed for the have for the have nots. That's where I am. So I plan to stick to my plan. Let me. Uh, and it, it appears that we. This is probably the most outstanding issue on, on the budget, and, and people are going to wonder why we spend so much time on a dollar and eighty cents. But I think it's important to understand. And uh, for me, it, it starts with the fact that uh, we set this up as enterprise system and. I guess what we need to understand is why was it set up as an enterprise system? I'm going to ask the administration to speak to that, either the manager or the budget director. Sure. Mayor, um, a couple years ago when we started looking at the solid waste fund and the multi-year needs, um, we looked at an opportunity to, we thought about the ways that we could actually um, generate revenues to support the fund moving forward. We looked at our peer cities, um, which Many of them do have a solid waste fee substantially larger than the fee we charge. Uh, we decided to go through a process improvement uh, initiative with the solid waste department where we isolated all of the revenues and expenditures and business lines in the departmental budget. So we wanted to look at all the business lines, what, what was the cost recovery of those business lines, and where we, we thought we should be charging a fee versus supporting with um, property tax or some other source of revenue and we isolated this as the solid waste collection as the line of business that we would move forward uh, to um, request to institute a fee. Uh, we brought forward initially $1.50 last year. That was the first fee and the reason again we, we brought it forward last year is we, we wanted to have the opportunity to go through the process of um, identifying the um, the revenue sources and expenditures associated with each business line as well as, as well as set up the structure and the system to make sure we capture that in information accurately. So we brought forward the dollar fifty cents. We discussed the transit issues and concerns and we in at the end of that process um, we had a dollar eighty cents to um, prevent us from from or allowing us to not raise the transit uh, fare increase the fare rates. Now let, let me take a little bit more time on this. Could you tell us, and maybe somebody's going to have to go back, what is the total budget for the solid waste department, roughly? The total budget for the solid waste department is $20, 000, $20 million, I'm sorry, for 14-15. $20 million? Yes. And could you tell us how much income, where the income 
is derived to support that $20 million in terms of property taxes, fees, services, any other type of funds, I mean, roughly? Yes. Okay. So um, the biggest source of revenue in the fund is, of course, the transfer from the general fund, which is $9.6 million. Well, let the public understand. Let the understand the so the general what? fund is primarily sort supported by property tax and sales tax, primarily taxes. Uh, and how much is that? That is um, roughly. I think it's between 90, 91 million, perhaps. No, the, to oh, the total absolutely. transfer to solid waste is nine point nine point six million. Is total okay. transfer from the general fund. And, and the bulk of that is property tax. That is correct. And who pays property taxes? Our right. residents and our businesses. All residents and businesses. That is correct. Okay, so we have a case where. $9.6 million to support the $20 million solid waste fund comes from property taxes, and everybody that pays property taxes pays this, whether they receive a pickup service or not. That's correct. Okay. Where does the, where does the other money come from? So um, the other money comes from the solid waste fee as what, well. What, what is the solid waste fee? The what solid waste fee, the dollar eighty cents, generates about $1.4 million for fourteen fifteen. Okay. And then the other uh, charges for services in there is the white good rebates and some of the other uh, past well, let's, revenues. Because let's, let's, uh, I want the public to understand these, these terms and what we're paying for in solid waste. Now, what is the white, what is that now? So the white good rebates is from vendor sales on white goods, that, that fee they charge. Okay. So we get a portion of that back. I think it's, um, I, I don't know the exact percentage. Um, we also um, get um, solid waste uh, tipping fees. We charge tipping fees right. the forty two fifty. Explain what tipping fees are. That is for the um, waste that goes over the scales. Mm -hmm. That is primarily commercial. Um, it's currently forty two fifty, forty two dollars and fifty cents per mm -hmm. ton. We're proposing to go to forty four dollars. And that's that's for garbage service that we don't collect. Others collect that it is and correct. bring it to us for disposal. Okay. And how, how much is that revenue roughly? I'm trying to get to the twenty million dollars. I'll have to get that total revenue. I okay. had the fee, but not right. the total revenue because we rolled it up in charges right. for services. Um, we also have um, in there um, the yard waste fee. Okay, and the yard waste fee people pay for that. That's a separate. If that is a separate okay. service line right. of business. Right. Um, that is the twelve dollars, and we are or seventy two dollars a year per subscriber. And we are proposing to change that fee as well. Well, the, the point is, it's a fee that we can charge. We're charging it now. And if people want it, they pay for it. If they don't want it, they don't pay for it, they don't get it. That's, that is correct. Okay. And that, that is about how much, just total dollars. Um, okay, one of your staff. About 87000 additional dollars. I don't have the total dollars broken okay. out here. All right. I'm sorry, I didn't that's, have the detail good. on that. And what, what, I'm, I'm trying to get to the $20 million. All right. Then we receive revenue from recycling services. Okay. That is correct, right. the right, recycling services. But the, I, I guess the, point, investment income, that's the point is that we have a $20 million solid waste budget that lets people pay for what they want and the white pickup and the yard fee and et cetera. Uh, Every pro person that pays property taxes pays about almost $10 million into this $20 million fee, whether they receive pickup service or not. And the persons that receive pickup service uh, are being asked to pay an additional dollar and 80 cents per pick if they receive it, which gives us about $1.4 million out of a $20 million budget. Yes. So we're really talking about how do we fill a gap for $1.4 million. Now, I guess the other piece that, that I, I, I have supported why we, we, it, we do this, I, I don't consider it to be a regressive fee. I've said it all along. I, I appreciate very much the whole issue about low income, moderate income. But if we're going to carry that case, you know, we can say the same thing about a bus system. The bus system is something that everybody pays for if you pay property taxes. Anybody can have a choice to use it if they want. I mean, if they want to use, ride the bus, they can. If they don't want to ride the bus, they don't have to. But we don't say if you make X number of dollars, you pay this kind of a bus fee. If you make this kind of dollars, you pay this kind of a bus fee. Uh, same thing with the garbage uh, collection. Uh, what we're saying is independent of what you make or where you stand in life, if you receive this service, we're asking you to pay an additional dollar and 80 cents for this. Meanwhile, all the other people who are paying property taxes 
are subsidizing it, just like they're subsidizing a bus system. And just like the bus system is available to anybody who wants to use it, we don't talk about whether you're low income or high income. Uh, the people to get a break are people like myself that are over 65 years of age. I ride it free. Uh, you guys pay for that. Now, it's up to me whether I want to ride it or not, but it's, it's there for me to do that. So I, I don't buy this argument about $1.80 being regressive for a service that is provided to everyone that receives it, but only those people who, not everyone, is, is, is supported by everyone who pays property taxes, but everybody who pays property taxes doesn't get the service. And, and that to me isn't, isn't regressive when you're talking about $1.80 for a subsidization of a fee that costs a lot more to pay. Now we could, we could collect $9.6 million through service fees if we wanted to raise the service fee and reduce all the property taxes. But that's, that's not the mode we're going in. So again, I come back to the fact that it was set up for a specific reason as an enterprise fee. And unless we start charging this fee, what it means is we're going to continue to increase property taxes to pay for the service. Unless you guys can figure out how to reduce that $800,000 that you're talking about next year. And, and we, we just know that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, we, we had three options that were presented. And sometime at point in time, I'm going to uh, entertain a motion for one of those three options. Uh, one option is the one that Councilman Shul just uh, uh, proposed, and that is to uh, convert the dollar and 80 cents to a property tax. The other one was that we don't convert it to a, a property tax, which is the mayor pro tem. And Councilwoman Katani, I put your proposition on the table because you weren't here, but I just thought it was fair that you had raised the issue. Uh, Councilman Brown had indicated it's something we might want to consider. So I'd, I'd like to yield the floor to you for your, your comments on that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did not support the $1.80 fee last year, so I am comfortable with repealing it this year, and I will be supporting option one. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. I, a question, Ms. Johnson. Um, we're talking about 800,000 shortfall next year. Is that additional shortfall? over, in other words, there'll be an additional 800,000 revenue needed next year? That is correct. And that would mean that if we stayed with the fee, we'd have to increase the fee 56% roughly. What, you know, that's eight out of 1.4, right? Yes. 56% increase in the fee. So the fee's not gonna stay static. If we, if we stay with the fee, then the fee is gonna keep growing in order to pay these continuing shortfalls. Um, I wanna make a couple of observations uh, first of all, uh, if um, for an owner of a $150,000 home, they pay $21.60 for the solid waste fee, they pay $9 for the taxes required this year to make the difference, a tenant in that same home would pay $0. Um, every person who lives in a single family rent house or a duplex or a quadruplex who has their trash picked up by the city pays the fee now, whether they are low income or median income or high income. And um, so that's the main reason. The question was asked, who pays property tax? And um, I realize that anybody who's a tenant pays it through their taxes, but um, the rents charged on rental property are market-based, they're not gonna go up $9 for a $150,000 house. So when people ask me who pays the property tax, I say it's the property owners, um, which is slightly different than the residents. Now, I, I understand very well the arguments um, for using a fee, and I, I honor that, but I support um, converting it to property tax. I do wanna also just observe briefly that the cost of the collection fee on a $1.4 million in property taxes is not 100000 but rather it's $14,000. Um, that's, the, that's the difference there. Thank you. I'm going to recognize Councilman Brown. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess I'd like to start by asking my friends at the, who, uh, support doing away with this fee, 
where is the, uh, the tipping point? And that is to say, instead of a dollar and 80 cents a month, um, say we cut that almost in half and it becomes a dollar a month. Would this still be an issue? Let me just try to put it a little, a little in a little bit of context, because I thought the mayor made a good point about uh, the, you know, what we're really arguing about here. But just even to put it in more context, we're arguing about 1.4 million dollars in a 378 million dollar budget. So I guess you'd, you'd say we're arguing over less than one quarter of one percent of our budget. So, uh, and as the mayor said, you know, you might wonder why we're spending so much time over 21 dollars 60 cents a year. Uh, and so I would say a couple of things. One is the fact that we're, you know, we shall recognize that we're here with a lot of agreement on, on we're, we're, we're here with a lot of agreement on, on almost everything. And that's great. And it's a tribute to, to Bertha and her staff and to the city manager. And, and, uh, and I think we've done a lot of good work to get to this point. So to me, the, the question is, um, it, it, it's, it's not that there's some amount of that fee that would be okay or not okay. It's, it's that uh, I do think that the fee hurts people with less money more than the property tax does. And so to me, it just makes sense to not have the fee. Um, it is regressive. And I'm not just talking about the poor, I'm actually talking about the middle class. I mean, anybody who owns a, a home of up to $370,000 uh, roughly would be better off uh, with with the uh, with the with the uh, with the property tax than they would with a fee. So, to me, it's not a matter of a tipping point. It's a matter of uh, do, how does it make sense to fund our solid waste. So I also want to make I say one other thing real quickly. <coughs> I actually thought you know that Mr. Mayor, your analogy about the the bus is a good one. Uh, that is to say people who ride the bus do pay something. Um, and even though the taxpayer pays the vast majority of our, of our fares. Uh, and so I recognize that as a fair point and, a, and, and comparable to this. And uh, I think we've done a really good job of, as opposed to a lot of cities, of keeping our, our bus fares low, and we, which is great. And we, uh, uh, the owner of a $200,000 home in Durham pays about roughly, by my math, about $75 a year to uh, support the bus system uh, and, and probably is not riding the buses. Um, and I think that that's a tribute to, you know, I think of that as kind of the Durham way. That is, we are different in some respects from our, uh, some of our peer cities who are charging lots of fees for, uh, you know, they may be higher, charging a higher bus fare, they may be charging higher fees for, um, for, for solid waste, but I think that that's a decision about how to finance government that we're making on the on the right side of the ledger. So, um, I guess in answer to your question, Gene, that um, it, for me it's 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 how we finance the government. Uh, what is the best way to do that? What's the fairest way of and and what what is the most uh, progressive way? And so that's sort of the way I think. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. I didn't know if somebody else wanted to respond to your question. Well, oh, yeah, sorry. My problem, if we do half a loaf, is that we have the same discussion next year. We're going to have to raise $800,000 more next year. If the fee's a dollar a month, $12 a year, next year we're going to have to discuss whether we're going to double it to raise that $800,000 or whether we're going to do property tax. I think we're better off either going one way or the other, personally. So we can settle it, hopefully settle it. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Don and, and Steve. And I, and I concur with you, Don, because I don't want to continue this until the next year's cycle. But um, I, I think your response, Steve, my friend, demonstrates what we're talking about here, and that is its ideology. 
It's pure ideology. And which on one hand is fine, but on the other hand, we're sit you know, we're elected here to make business decisions, economic decisions, and we've got a tremendous gap in the solid waste department. Uh, Bertha just told us that. And um, you know, if, if we lived, if we lived in an ideal world, it would be fun to have this discussion. But we need to move beyond this, folks. Um, I, I'm more interested in, in, in coming to basic business decisions that I think are fair for user fees and not to get bound by pure ideology of regressive versus non-regressive. I mean, you can make the argument that any fee or tax uh, that is directed against those who make $25,000 a year is regressive. Yeah, you can make that argument. But on the other hand, we have budget gaps to fill here. And I want to go back to the, to the uh, data example. And because I don't think we can separate these two, particularly two since we had the, uh, the, the data fee argument which was followed by the solid waste discussion. And an analysis of 20 cities in the southeast, 20 cities, uh, Durham ranks very close to the bottom. We're still charging a dollar for a fee. Um, and as Mark Aronson mentioned to us and told us and informed us, 70% of all data writers make under $25,000 a year. Think about that. And so we are subsidizing using general fund fees to the tune of $10 million a year to have a bus system that really serves those, you can say, in poverty or the statistically those making less than $25,000 a year. That's general fund money. So among other things, I don't want anyone walking out of here thing, thinking that or implying that the city of Durham doesn't care about, doesn't help, doesn't assist it's poor people. Uh, and I have never, in the 10 years that I have been here, had so much debate, discussion, dialogue, analysis, over a $1.80 per month fee. So I don't know how this rose to the top. We know why it rose to the top. You know, that's because of one political action committee or group, a group that I, I'm usually in favor with, that I usually support, but how this was selected out, I just don't understand it. Particularly here in Durham, very progressive city, in terms of all that we do to try and attempt to help those who are less fortunate than we are. Um, and this brings up another irony, and that is supposedly the reason for this is to, to have a non uh, that The reason for this is to do away with a regressive fee of $1.80 a month and so we can help those who, among other places, live in East Durham and so on. Well, 
I need to be candid and suggest to you, and I think that the mayor and others can confirm this, we imposed this fee last year. And I have heard nothing from, to use an expression that our formal, former colleague, Howard Clement, used. Uh, I ha have heard nothing from those who live on his side of town about this fee. Uh, you know, all of us come here with embellished and inculcated with, with different principles and beliefs. And I guess, you know, well, some, sometimes you just have to draw the line and, and do what's right for the city as a whole and to not get caught up in this whole aggressive tax structure over a dollar eighty cents a month. Um, I just don't understand it, folks. But I do understand the budget. And I understand the need for us to deal with the outstanding debt that our solid waste department is going to face over the next decade. Uh, we need money to purchase. We need a, a, a solid revenue stream to purchase uh, the machinery that is necessary to provide our citizens with a cost-effective budget that will deal them the highest services possible. And that's for all of our citizens. Um, you know, we're looking at debt services of over close to $11 million. So I think the focus the dialogue should be, how are we going to deal with this over the next 10 years and not to focus on the exclusive argument of that a dollar 80 cents a month is regressive. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, 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 uh, we, we're going to move on this side and get, 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 it, get it out of the way, but I, I, I just want to say that, you know, Low income and martyr people speak up very well for themselves. <laughs> I heard it last week when we were going through the poverty piece. Mm -hmm. I hear it in the streets. I've not had one, not, not one person, not one. to come up and say anything to me about this dollar and eighty cents uh, collection fee. And I appreciate those that are advocating that we do away for it because you think it's regressive. But I can tell you, those people you're talking about aren't complaining. <laughs> they aren't complaining. I haven't heard one of them complaining. And I, and I purposely said that over the past few weeks, because I said as soon as I say that, I know I'm getting a bunch of letters saying, <laughs> do away with it. Well, the letters came from the same people that have been doing it all along, and they aren't the low-income persons that you consider to be in a regressive case. So they speak up very well for themselves, very well, and they haven't spoken up on this issue in terms of being uh, regressive to them. But Look, have, may I add one more point sure. quickly, Mr. Mayor? Sure. And, and that is, Folks, uh, property taxes matter. Property taxes matter. And we're not just talking about, you know, and Steve made some very good points last week about attracting businesses. We, we're attracting businesses, thank goodness. But they matter, most importantly, to our citizens. And we already rank second among the largest cities in this state in the property tax burden. And this year, when you look at the county proposed budget and their increase and ours, and especially too, if you add the, what, the 0.6 cents that we're talking about here, it's going to it really may just put us over the top. And I'm not too keen on Durham having the highest property 
tax rate in the state. So that's a, another serious consideration I think we need to keep in mind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I think we've talked it out. <laughs> and I'm going to entertain a motion. I recognize Councilman Shul since he said he wanted to uh, make a motion first. Mr. Mayor, I... I, I Mr. Peterson, I'm running the meeting, okay? I, I'm running the meeting. Thank you. Uh, recognize Councilman Shul. Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I would assume then this would be on uh, D, which you... That's correct. Separate. Is that That's correct? correct. Thank you. Uh, I would move option one. Uh, I propose a substitute motion as follows. Uh, fees to adopt an ordinance labeled option one to change municipal solid waste disposal commercial load fee schedule part 14-101 to change solid waste yard waste collection fee schedule part 14-106 to adopt the city of Durham budget ordinance labeled option one for fiscal year 2014-15. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded in further discussion. Here and on, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It, it passes four to third. Miss Miss Corey, you didn't vote. I voted against. Okay, it passes four three, and the noes are Mayor Bell, Councilmember Brown, and. Class member no. Cole McFadden should be no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's let's move back to item ten. The rest of the budget items. And uh, again, this is not a public hearing, but it's, it's an item. And I do have one person that has signed up to speak on item ten. Uh, v. Peterson. And you have two minutes on this item, Ms. Peterson. I need to. Uh, Mr. Mayor um, and city council members, um, I hear folks talking about a small item on the budget. I like to talk about the public, uh, the public protection, a $94 million budget there for those folks. And that is one of the highest. And since I'm only, I only have a few minutes here to, or a few seconds to speak, I'm asking the citizens in this community to look at some other ways about uh, our young folks in this community being arrested. This public safety budget, most of those dollars are gonna go to the police department and to build a new police station. We do not, and that's fine it, it, if we need that. But this community needs to address the crime problem, the so-called crime problem that is going on with so many of our young men being arrested. And it starts with the police department. It does not start with the sheriff department. It does not start with the courthouse. It does not start with the attorneys. It starts city council members with the police department going out in the community arresting men and women who they feel have committed crimes. And then they are allowed to linger in the jails anywhere between a year to four years waiting to go to trial. And part of that, we are paying for that. We're paying for the policing and then on the county level, our taxes keep going up because we're also paying for it on the county level by persons being in jail. Now, folks, I think there are three problems here, and I want to say this real quick. We've got to look at merging this government, the city and the county. And a lot of the young folks that are out here, you soon will pick up the torch and run with it. We do not need two governments in this community anymore. That's old and it's outdated. And you folks need to start trying to look at some other ways. Most of those folks up there are like me. We have gray hair. We need some young, new vision and leadership in this community to bring about one government, Mr. Mayor. Thank one you, government. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. You're welcome, Mr. Mayor. Quite welcome. Uh, again, this is not a 
Mr. It's not a public hearing, but I want to feel free if you have a comment and make a comment. Two minutes. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bell. Yes, sir. City Council member. Since I only have two minutes, I want to speak to page six, dealing with the, uh, the grants, in particular, the Edward Memorial Justice Assistant Grant. Do you see it? Number 15, JAG Grant, J-A-G. Okay, to be real briefly, Faith Coalition and Southern Coalition submitted to the police department under the Freedom of Information Act for documentations regarding the use of this JAG grant. We received volumes, boxes of Freedom of Information information that was blocked out, blatted out. Some of these informants we found out had been paid by the police department in their investigations, convictions, even some people went before grand jury on bogus information. I just returned from New York, and I'll read this in my conclusion. Roger Logan, who served 17 years in prison for murder. Mr. Logan, now 53 years old, was sentenced to 25 years to life for the 1997 shooting death. Mr. Logan was jailed, indicted, put in prison on the money that, that the police had given to an informant. This woman, after it was learned that a woman who claimed she witnessed the crime was actually in jail when the homicide occurred. So I'm asking that the city ask the police chief and his department to give us more accountability on these funds. They never responded to our question, where did the money go? It was signed off by their supervisors, signed off to informants who may now have people lying in North Carolina Central Prison. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So Matt, did we get the name of this gentleman? I assume this is, Mr. You want to state your name for the record? You want to go state your, state your name for the record? Don't send no one after me. My name is Minister Rafiq Zaidi. I'm the president of the Black Concerned Citizens, and I, reserved, I reside at J.J. Henderson Towers, 807 South Duke Street, apartment 830. Thank you. I, I have your card. Thank you. Okay, we are trying to be as open as we can on this last budget item. Uh, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege on this item. I, I received a letter uh, from the Triangle Regional Film Council uh, saying that they had not been included in the budget. I just got the information. I asked the gentleman if he wanted to come and take two or three minutes to speak to the item. If he does, well, he's gone, so he doesn't want to speak. Uh, any other items that, that the council wants to speak to? Anybody else in the public want to speak on this budget? Okay, we're going to go back to the budget that we have before us and entertain a motion on it. Right. I'm sorry. No, just ask for clarification. I wasn't clear on what option 1E is. It looks to me that we may have adopted the budget with option 1 already. Can someone clarify that? Well, I think the mayor the mayor uh, separated that item from the uh, the consideration. Mm -hmm. So in essence, uh, that's going to kind of move that item back into the totality of the budget. That's why we had it set up as a substitute motion. So now, with that in it, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just a minute. Film commission guy is back. Oh, the film commission person just came back. Rob, do you care to make any comments? Uh, you have two minutes. What I explained is that you sent an email to me that I just read today, which basically said you were not included in the administrative budget, and I said you have an opportunity a couple of minutes to explain. Yes, so. thank you. Um, I apologize. I got a little dry and had to run out for some water. Uh, I can only hope that it was an oversight uh, that the Triangle Regional Film Commission $10,000 grant was, uh, was not included in the city budget. I only found out on Friday that it was not. 
<coughs> Therefore, I was not at the earlier public hearing to speak about it. Uh, I have met with uh, Grace Asenza and Peter Coyle at the uh, Office of Economic and Workforce Development, <coughs> and they uh, have appeared to be on board and ready to move forward to continue to support uh, the Regional Film Commission. Uh, we are doing some important work, I feel. Uh, we're working towards an internship program as well. We uh, <coughs> have in the last couple of years on a shoestring budget managed to bring in uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of spending in this area uh, according to the uh, budget figures from the North Carolina Film Office. Uh, this past year uh, we brought in $446,000. Uh, I would hope that the City Council would see clear to put our $10,000 grant back into the budget uh, so we can continue this work. Uh, <clears throat> even with the incentive program in doubt, most of the uh, projects that are brought to our area are not qualified for the incentive program anyway. Therefore, uh, we feel like the work that we have just started in the last couple of years uh, needs to continue moving forward. Uh, for the benefit of all the citizens of Durham. I'll be glad to answer any questions about our budget or our work. Well, what, what wasn't clear to me is what your total budget was. It wasn't clear to me what other revenues you were receiving to support your budget other than the city of Durham. <coughs> we, uh, we have had difficulty raising money uh, since the film incentive came in question last year, uh, particularly uh, on the public side. Uh, private folks have said, have made pledges, but are waiting uh, for later. Uh, obviously, uh, Wake County is our biggest supporter, as they're the biggest county in the 13-county area uh, that we uh, serve. Uh, uh, in my personal opinion, Durham is uh, in a perfect position with the Center for Documentary Studies and uh, the program that uh, Dr. McKissick Melton is running at North Carolina Central. Uh, to really become the center of uh, production in this area. Uh, we're just uh, asking that the, uh, the City Council continue uh, to support us uh, at the same level uh, that they have supported us in the past. Uh, we did ask for an increase this year since we have not asked for one before, uh, but uh, certainly uh, going to zero uh, is not helpful to our efforts uh, in Durham. Um, when you say regional, can you tell us what other, you mentioned Wake County, what other municipalities? Uh, we, we represent a 13 county area that's mirrored by the Research Triangle Regional Partnership. Uh, we go from Warren County down to uh, Moore County. Uh, to the east we go as far as uh, Johnson County and to the west Orange County. Well, have any of those municipalities um, provided any source of funding? Uh, so Franklin County has been one of our staunchest supporters. Uh, we have worked hard for them. They have uh, <clears throat> been hand in hand with the TV show Lizard Lick Towing now for three years. Uh, we've got pledges from Johnston County uh, that have not been fulfilled yet, but uh, we expect are forthcoming. Uh, <clears throat> we have had some support in the past from Moore County, uh, although this year they were putting all their eggs in the uh, U.S. Open basket. Uh, therefore, we did not get any funding from them this year. Uh, we have been operating on whatever we can raise. Uh, even though we haven't met our budget, uh, we have cut costs in every way possible to continue recruiting spending to this area. And uh, as I said, the, the spending that we have, uh, the figures from the uh, North Carolina Film Office uh, for this year uh, are, is 446000 of 2544000 spent in the area. Recognize this, City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, at this point, we would certainly be glad to provide Council background information on, uh, on our analysis of, uh, of this initiative and uh, why we did not recommend funding. Uh, we, can, we can provide that, you know, sometime after the return from recess and if uh, Council feels that uh, there's basis to uh, restore funding. I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to, you know, find find some way to do that. But uh, I think you would benefit from the totality of our evaluation as well. Okay. Well, let's, any other comments from Council? Uh, one, one can ask Councilman Davis. Thank you. As with the previous speaker, could I get the name of this, this speaker also? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Rob Schof, I'm Managing Director of the Triangle Regional Film Commission. Rob, you can fill out a yellow card for the, for the record. Uh, That's Councilman Brown. Yes, question for Rob. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, what does uh, Wake County provide? Uh, we, at, at the current time, are uh, receiving uh, 20000 from Wake County uh, from public, uh, and uh, we have grant proposals in to uh, foundations in Wake County that we are hoping will be fruitful uh, to the tune of $100,000. Thank you. Well, recognize the mayor pro um, Sir, did the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau have anything in the budget for you? I, I just can't not recall. I know you were trying to get some money from them. Yes, the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau continues to spend uh, what they were spending on the Durham Film Office, uh, which mm -hmm. was a part-time operation that, uh, that joined in with the Triangle Regional Film Commission when it was formed uh, in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, they pay for uh, fees on our real scout system, uh, which is required by the North Carolina Film Office. However, uh, the state does not provide any funding uh, to our operation. And uh, they also have provided some travel money for us and some staff support. Uh, that is all spent directly from the CBB uh, to those vendors. Uh, and none of it is, uh, is actually paid to the Regional Film Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you reside? Uh, we're in downtown Durham right now. We were in the Liberty Warehouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Thank you, Council Members. Again, trying to be as open as possible on this budget. Uh, uh, so, if there are no further comments, uh, we're back to the original motion and second that we adopt the budget as presented uh, with the record reflecting the vote that we did on the, waters, the, waste, the waste collection fee. So, yeah. so when, when we adopt the budget, the record will show that I voted against the repeal, okay? That I just want to make that clear. Okay, I want to need to make sure I'm understanding. So you all are going to vote on the remaining ordinances that are on the on the agenda, the remaining ordinances. I just want to make sure that my vote stays as it did with the other. I support the rest of the budget. Yes, the remaining ordinances that are left. Okay. Yes. Are we correct, Bertha? Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay, uh, I think we're all clear on that. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Um, okay. oh, Jane, Jane wants to vote against the budget. That's fine. That's 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 what you wanted, right? You wanted to vote against the budget, right? That's right. The record reflects that. Mayor Bell, I didn't get a, the the first person that made the motion and who seconded the motion on this last Council vote. Councilman Shule okay. made the motion and who seconded it. I thought you were second in your race. Right, right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair. Recognize uh, Councilman Davis. Uh, just so I can be clear, uh, procedurally, we voted on the solid waste item separately, and then we came back and voted on all the other issues. So there was not a combined vote for the budget as amended. That was that was because I think I heard that we voted separately on the solid waste issue, and then we voted on all of the other issues pertaining to the budget. So it appears that we have that separate vote on the solid waste fee, and then we have a series of ordinances that pertain to all of the other things. And it sounds like then that a vote against that, that second vote was against all of the other issues. Oh. But, but why would they, I'm trying to figure out if, if the problem that we have. Some of the parts equals the total budget. And one of the parts was the solid waste. Fee. Yes, I understand and we, we that. Voted to support and I understand that. that was a separate vote. But we voted to support it. Yes, okay. that's right. We voted to support it. Then we voted for all the other parts of the budget. And everybody supported it but Councilman Brown. So it gives us a total budget. 
Item one plus all the others gives us the total budget. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm done trying to figure out why. Well, okay. All right. But the total, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. The, the total budget includes the rescission of the solid waste fee. And that's why I'm voting against the total budget. Okay. <laughs> First time, but I understand. Trust me. Right. We haven't done this in quite a while. Yeah. Whether we like it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mayor, how many budgets have you done? Yeah, I didn't want to call names. But. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. <laughs> okay. Mr. Mayor, how many budgets yep. have you been a part of at, at uh, City Council and uh, County Commission, just out of curiosity? Forty. Forty. Yeah. Okay, let's go to item 11. <laughs> yeah, quite a few. <laughs> okay, I'm here. Item 11, amendment to the Durham City Code, section 4622, regulating the posting of a prohibition against carrying a concealed handgun on city recreational facilities. Repeal of Durham City Code, sections 4623, 4627, containing regulations of dangerous weapons. Entertain a motion on the item. I didn't see you sign up for that count, Representative. Oh, it's stretched out. Okay. Victoria Peterson, number two. Two minutes. I don't know why I'm losing a minute, Mr. Mayor. But anyway. Sorry. <laughs> um, I encourage your arguments. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Baker. In the um, parks, the concealed handguns, are persons still going to be allowed to? I'm a supporter, to let everyone know. I support the public being able to protect ourselves. The police are not around us 24-7. Uh, we do have some, some crime issues, and, um, and we even see it on countrywide now. Uh, restaurants are being robbed and um, banks are being robbed. So, Mr. Baker, can you just explain to the public, um, will the, those persons who still would like to carry guns, will they still be allowed? And those who, are, who want to carry conceal, conceal handguns, are they being denied on the, on the parks? So if you can sort of put a stop there. And also, Mr. Baker, another quick question I'd like to ask you, if I can get. Can you please uh, uh, ask uh, whoever in the system uh, how many of our young men and women have been in jail over six months uh, that have been arrested by the Durham police? Can you get that information for me, please? How many persons that have been in the jail over six months that have been arrested by the Durham police officers, please. As for, your, as for your second question first, I'm certain that the Sheriff's Department would have that kind of information and would refer you to the Sheriff's office. Otherwise, I'm just making a phone call to them. Um, but, but I wouldn't have that information. Right, I, but by you being the city police office, I mean the, the city attorney, I don't want to run all over the place. Okay, I want my tax dollars being used well. You if only you have could, to run to one place, which is well. If you can where, do that for me, where it is. If you can, if um, you can do that for me, please. Okay. But can you answer? Um, can you share with us about the conceal? And, and and to be clear, uh, what we've done is we've taken the Durham City ordinances and simply made them consistent with changes in state law uh, that restricted the city's abilities to prohibit um, uh, concealed weapons in, in certain city uh, facilities, namely parks. Uh, there was a change back in 2012, effective in 2013, and the General Assembly has whittled that down, those changes down as well. So this is simply, um, uh, we don't have the ability to simply say you cannot have concealed weapons in parks. They're, they're limited to specific buildings um, and most playground areas, except the actual playground part. Um, we, we can't, we don't have the ability to make a posting to prohibit uh, weapons. Okay. 
uh, or concealed weapons there. So all we've done here, this is nothing that's come out of Durham. This is simply to conform mm -hmm. our current ordinances with what um, the General Assembly has um, limited the city's abilities to restrict. And so that's then what those persons here. who want to carry uh, concealed handguns in the parks, we are allowed to do that now? Pers pursuant to, to what's in the ordinance. Okay. Um, you'd have to, to, to specify exactly what's in there. We've changed the regulation to be consistent with state law. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Entertain a motion on item. It's been proper to move and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote and close the vote. That's item 11. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We're going to move now to the city manager's priority item. And what I'm asked the city manager to do is to read for the record, although council members have a copy of it, uh, his response to the reviewer uh, regarding the recommendations of the Durham Human Relations Commission and Civilian Police Review Board, Review, Review Board on regarding police department matters. Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the record, uh, this is a uh, memorandum uh, that I uh, sent to the uh, Mayor and City Council today uh, in response to uh, the request that uh, we provide some information at this, uh, no later than this meeting as to um, uh, the approach that we will be uh, using. As you indicated, the subject is the review and response regarding recommendations of Durham Human Relations Commission and Civilian Police Review Board regarding police department matters. Uh, this memorandum is written to the City Council by me and says as follows, at the May 22nd, 2014 City Council work session, the Durham Human Relations Commission presented recommendations regarding allegations of racial bias and profiling against the Durham Police Department. The report contained 34 recommendations for consideration. Immediately preceding this report, the City of Durham Civilian Police Review Board prepared and presented 10 recommendations to the city manager regarding their views on improving the role of the Civilian Police Review Board in police community relations. Following the presentation at the May 22, 2014 meeting, the city manager was directed to report back to city council at the June 16, 2014 city council meeting as to what steps would be taken to review and respond to these recommendations and to provide a timeline for completing the work. As I stated at the May 22, 2014 work session, I take the concerns raised by the community as well as those raised by advocacy organizations very, very seriously and recognize the necessity for a trusting relationship between the Durham community and the Durham Police Department. I do realize that as the city manager to which the police chief and the police department report, I am personally responsible and accountable for ens ensuring that this trust is upheld at the highest and most responsible level and I am confident the dedicated men and women who serve the community in the Durham Police Department want the same thing. As such, I have committed that I will personally lead the review and evaluation of these recommendations, along with several, several members of the city manager's office. This process will include a review of the best law enforcement practices and North Carolina peer city practices as they relate to the recommendations. The review will consider feedback and response from the Durham Police Department. I will also commit to meet separately with each of the advocacy organizations that have participated in the process to date. The purpose of these meetings is not to rehear the testimony presented to the Human Relations Commission over the last several months, but to hear their thoughts and priorities on the recommendations. The City Attorney's Office will also be consulted and play a critical role in this evaluation as many of the recommendations may potentially be impacted by statutory or case law or by city charter or local ordinances. I am confident that the city attorney will personally see to the timely and thorough support that will be necessary from that office. If during the course of this review, it becomes apparent that a particular recommendation is appropriate and within my authority to direct its implementation, I will do so immediately. Other recommendations that may sustain concurrence but are outside of my authority will need to come back to the city council for consideration. Also, it is reasonable to expect that some recommendations both within and beyond my authority will not receive my concurrence. In all cases, those two will be presented to the City Council with support materials for consideration in conjunction with the final report in response to all 44 recommendations. To date, issues associated with wrapping up the fiscal year 2015 budget have delayed significant work on this review. We will begin in earnest the week of June 16th. 
Due to the complexity of several of the recommendations, additional research needed, coordination of meetings and summer vacation schedules, I believe it is reasonable to think that this work can be completed in approximately 60 days. As such, I have suggested the report be presented at the August 21st work session. If the report progresses and is completed sooner than expected, we will be prepared to present our response report at the August 7th work session. Again, I wish to thank all of those who have participated in this process so diligently and patiently, especially the City Council for allowing the external process to proceed without intervention. I look forward to the completion of my review of this matter and presenting my recommendations to you. I am confident that to the extent trust and confidence have been negatively impacted between the City of Durham, the Durham Police Department, and the Durham community, they can be recovered and enhanced moving forward. Thank you. Okay, now this is a request that this city council made of the city manager with regard to that issue. Uh, he's brought back his uh, report and I first want to refer to members on the council if you have any questions, comments of the city manager's report. I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think we all wish that this could all be done, taken care of instantly, but we know that it can't. Uh, we've heard from a few people in the last few days that they hope we would be able to act tonight on some things. But um, I think that uh, members of the community, including some of our friends who are here, need to understand that the council really hasn't had a chance to uh, vet these recommendations as a group and that we need to do that. Uh, and we need the administration to help us on some of them. And I thought your timetable sounds good, Mr. Manager. Uh, and I also appreciate the sentiments you expressed about the need to uh, rebuild the trust, and I think that's an essential, uh, a, 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 an essential part of our task as well. Uh, and so I, I really, uh, I thought you had a really good statement, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Are there any other persons who want to comment on this item? Let, let, let me say this before we do that. Uh, I, I saw some phages grimacing and eyes turning up when I was first asked about this item. It's my intent to hear comments. I'm going to limit it to two minutes, but I just wanted to be made clear that this was a request that the council made of the city manager. He's made his report back. Uh, the council needs to act first in terms of whether it supports the manager's recommendation or not. Uh, at some point in time, I'm going to entertain a motion to accept the city manager's re report as presented or modified uh, from the council. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to let the council make his comments. Uh, those in the public that have asked to speak, I'm going to allow each one of you two minutes to speak on this item. After you've spoken, then I'll entertain a motion from the council to either accept the council, the city manager's report, or modify it, or what have you, uh, just in case you say something that might strike the members of the council as something they want to include. So, Jane, do you want to comment now, or do you want to wait to hear from other persons? Okay. Uh, I'm going to call the names of the persons that have signed up to speak. If you go to the podium to the right, uh, two minutes, and please uh, respect the time. Uh, I have Chris Tiffany, uh, Minister Zahidi, uh, Hilton Cancel, and Reese. Is this Charles Reese? I'm sorry, what's the name? Iris Reese. So if you can come to the podium to your right, and you each have two minutes. Okay, anyone having been targeted by cops know cops target people for reasons other than probable cause. And there are problems in addition to racial profiling at traffic stops. The most serious repeated complaint the systematic mishandling of complaints. For example, the chief said parents, well, I'm sorry, uh, two minute version, uh, two parents took a complaint repeatedly to both the police department and city hall that a cop pulled a gun on their eight year old son. But complaints are being handled verbal only, screened out by desk officers, sergeants on up, so IID, professional standards, the police chief, the city manager, the c chief administrator to whom the police chief reports, Anyone over the rank of sergeant can say they didn't know what street cops are really doing. In targeted neighborhoods, if you're a teenager, you're a criminal suspect. If you use drugs at Duke, it's okay. Um, but only racial profiling at traffic stops was advertised for the public hearings. 
complaints of anti-loitering cops at bus stops falls on deaf ears. Looking only at racial profiling at traffic stops ignores even concerns about male cops targeting women. Existing data could identify individual male officers who have been targeting women, but the department does not identify suspect officers from its own data. And failure to file complaints received in one ear and out the other means the department is willfully ignorant. Complaints have to be documented more reliably than the department's hide and seek form that has less than half the size of a sheet of toilet paper for your complaint. So complaints should be filed by civilians who take complaints every day, all day at City Hall. The city manager's one call system is professional, neutral, and above all, safe. You can even make anonymous calls. To file police complaints, call one call, 560-1200. Make it true that one call does it all. A cop here explained to me how they can claim to get consent from anyone with a trick question. Mind if we search you? Yes or no, they search you. S you have to somehow Chris, tell angry th armed Chris, men thank you. you refuse thank you. demand an NCR thank you. consent form. Copy for you, copy for them, and write consent and refuse. You can leave your comments with the clerk if you like, your written comments. The next person, if you just identify your name and yes, address uh, again, Rafi please. Zaidi. Uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Faith Coalition, and I present to you their statement, which states, since we first brought our concerns about racial profiling to city council last September, hundreds of innocent people have been wrongfully stopped by the police and subjected to unnecessary invasive searches. The overwhelming number of them have been black. I repeat, the overwhelming number of them have been black. Some of them, like Mr. John Hill, have been met with excessive force and violence when they sought an explanation for why they were stopped. Personally, I experienced being among Mr. John Hill that Sunday morning. He got on the bus, which I was riding to Muhammad's temple, and he was bandaged up, and I asked him, did you go to the hospital? He said, no. He said, the EMS wagon, the emergency service wagon, bandaged me up somewhere near the police station. And in phase conclusion, they says this, these residents and many others in this community are looking forward to working with their elected officials in the city to address their very important issues. In my conclusion, those who consider these matters or these issues as something that is travelous, something that can be made for an entertainment or a show, I want you to remember Fayetteville. Number one, there was an open revolt at the police station in Fayetteville when these same issues were brought up. Number two, the retirement of the Fayetteville police chief, and yes, the resignation of the center manager. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Hilton Cancel. Hi, my name is Hilton Cancel, and I'm representing the, the National Latino Peace Officers Association of North Carolina chapter. I worked uh, for several years with the Durham Police Department, starting with uh, Kent Fletcher, um, and all the way through our present chief. And I'm just a little concerned about some of the things that I've been hearing in terms of rumors about getting rid of the chief. I, I can only say that I'm concerned about these rumors, and I hope that uh, this August body will give him a fair shake in terms of not getting rid of him for a host of reasons. We already just went through a situation with Tony Asion, who's the chief of the Capitol Police Department, and we had to sue over it. He got his day in court. He won. Of course, there was a, uh, there's been appeal on the part of the state. So thank you for your time. I'm short. You're welcome. Iris Reese. Sir. First of all, thank you all this for being out here and listening to us. I just wanted to take a moment to respectfully, respectfully come before you to express my concerns as a Latina, as a Hispanic business owner in Durham for the last 16 years, but most importantly, a citizen of a city that I chose to live in because of its diversity here. 
I want to read to you something that says, for quite some time there have been talks in the Hispanic community about the potential removal of Chief Lopez due to allegations of discrimination and racism. And we have had individuals making public requests to remove Ch Chief Lopez from his position as a quote unquote solution to issues in the city of Durham. Issues that have stemmed long before his acceptance of Chief of Police and issues that were proven to be just allegations. We've just heard what happened in Fayetteville with their chief and their city manager. Your segue, um, city manager Bonfield was excellent. I agree with you, I totally agree with you. Let's not allow this to happen in our city. I ask you to please not fall in line with those making empty allegations and accusations. And please do not let the actions of these people who make you, don't let these actions of these individuals make you feel strong armed to have our chief removed. He's leaving, his leaving before the 10 years will be a strong indication that politics of special interest groups have once again managed the politics of the city. There have also been talks that this, the Hispanic community does not stand behind their chief. Well, today, I'm using my voice. And I'm using my voice because I want you to know that we will no longer allow anyone else to speak for us. We are articulate and we can speak for ourselves. I stand before you with, with no other intent or purpose than to represent our community and support our chief, but most importantly, for the sake of encouraging true unity amongst us, all of us, not just Hispanics, but minority as a whole. We need to move away from the we's and the thumbs and become us, because only through us are we gonna move forward. I'm just saddened and I just hope that hopefully we can work together. Thank you. Uh, is this Darcy Wilson? Nancy. Oh, Nancy Wilson. Pardon me, Nancy. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. um, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. I actually had intended to read the Fade Coalition speech, but uh, uh, since Rafiq read it, I will just make a couple of statements. Uh, my name is Nancy Wilson. I'm the executive director of Spirit House, and we are an organizational member of the Fade Coalition. We've been working with the Fade Coalition since since day one. Um, and I, I want to make a comment about uh, the comment that you made, Mr. Mayor, about the facial expressions that you saw. Um, and I want to be clear about my facial expression, which was because you made a statement about this not being a witch hunt. And that was very concerning to me, because the Fade Coalition from the very beginning has not been individualizing this, this our concerns. This really has been about institutional racism and about what we see as something that is systemic. And it's not just systemic in Durham, it's systemic across the country. And our desire for this great city of Durham to actually act in a way where we as a city can actually address the issues. There are many things that we understand as a coalition cannot be done because we are, it, 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 it is uh, up to the state. But there are several things that we understand that we know can be done. We appreciate the city manager's decision or working over the next 60 days. Again, if you look back to our initial um, request, we were asking for 60 days, and now that's almost a year ago, but we were still asking for a full comprehensive look at all the many things that we were bringing before the city council and the things that you can do. What we would ask at this time is in those 60 days for all of you to go into the community and have conversations with the community members that are most impacted by this issue. It's not just numbers on a piece of paper. It is real people. It is Mr. John Hill. It's a several other community members who feel targeted by the police department. And, and the only way that you're going to hear those stories is if you go into those communities and have conversations with those very real people. So I hope that you all will consider doing that. If you need any help, if you need us to, to bring folks to you, we are more than willing to have people come and explain what's happening in their neighborhoods. Thank you. I appreciate your explanation for the witch reaction to my witch comment. Witch hunt comment, not witch comment. Speaking of witches, uh, let, me, let me get to uh, Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, please. Uh, my name is David Hall. Uh, I uh, am a member of the community here in Durham, live at Gray Avenue. I am a member of the community in that I sit on boards in Durham. I appreciate living in Durham. I try to make Durham a uh, be part of the things in Durham that makes life livable. Uh, 
I'm also here to say that through this last 10 months, I speak from personal experience. My family speaks from personal experience. We've moved into the target area. I'm an attorney here. I work with the community, decided to move into the community, and my family has been experiencing things with the police department. Most recently, within the last couple of weeks, the police pull up to my son while he's walking downtown. Not, can we have a conversation? It's, get in the car. Get in the car. Those were the words spoken to him. Not, can we have a conversation? Can we talk to you about something that's going on? What do you expect a teenager headed to college to do when the police pull up and simply say, get in the car? We don't make this stuff up. As Ms. Wilson pointed out, we have not been here calling for heads to roll. We're not on a witch, witch hunt. We're talking about systemic and institutional racism, and it's real, and it happens. I'm here to tell you it happens to my family. Uh, v. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and city council members, you have heard over the last year from different folks, and you've heard from me, so I'm just going to cut right to the chase. I've asked this council, and so I'm going to ask it again. I'm asking this council, the people who we have voted to put in office, to ask the city manager, to ask the police chief to resign. Many persons who I have spoken to in the African American community, they're very tired of this man. There may be a few who may want him to stay, but Steve, in my community, just about all the time, African Americans come to me because they see me here. And they have asked me, Mr. Mayor, and other city council members, when is the city council going to do something about the police chief, Mrs. Peterson? We see you down there. We hear you. And there is a problem with him. If this was in um, Cora, you said that the city is sort of like the, the city manager is sort of like a CEO. If he's a CEO and Mr. Bonfield, I like him. I think you've tried to do a very good job for this community. I'm going to say that publicly. But with this issue, there is something wrong. Because if the police chief was somewhere else in a company, in a, I, uh, in a 500 fortune company, he would have been gone. They would have asked him to leave. This has been a bat an embarrassment. And the lawsuits on Mr. Brown that some of us are very concerned about that is causing our taxes to go up. We have to pay for these lawsuits. Uh, Mr. Davis, this community, the taxpayers, are going to have to pay for that. Thank you, Mr. Please Davis. ask the city manager. Right. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker to ask the police chief to leave. Last speaker and is thank you. Charlie Reese. Thank you, Mayor Bell. <clears throat> Excuse me, members of the city council, city manager Bonfield. Uh, first thing I want to say, the loft topic, the debate that was held in this chamber tonight about the solid waste fee was worthy of a great city. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I don't just say that because I supported the resolution. Um, the second ish thing I want to say is that uh, thanks to the uh, crack reporting of the Herald Sun, uh, I need to issue a clarification about the letter that our organization sent to you on Friday. Um, Durham People's Alliance and, none of, and the Fade Coalition have not asked uh, for the use of written consent forms uh, for all vehicle searches. Uh, that's not reasonable. Officers have a legitimate reason, uh, whether they have probable cause or some other legal justification, to search a vehicle uh, without consent. Uh, what People's Alliance and what I intended to convey in that letter, uh, and the Herald Sun has been kind enough to issue a clarification in their story tonight, is that uh, we support the FADE recommendation and also the recommendation put forward by the Human Resource Commission 
uh, that officers be required to use a written form when they ask for consent to search a vehicle. Uh, that is an area where significant racial disparity has been identified uh, here in Durham. And uh, we believe, along with uh, other members of the community whose voices we join uh, in this effort, that um, that, that one step uh, will create a significant, will have a significant impact in reducing that disparity. The third thing I want to say tonight is that, um, I, first of all, I thank all the members of the City Council who responded to my letter specifically, and also City Manager Bonfield. You've been very responsive to us and all of the groups in the community who've reached out to you to talk about this. I appreciate that. Uh, and I understand that the issues that have been raised by the Human uh, the, Human Res the Human Rights Commission and, um, and the other community organizations are very complicated. They involve issues that uh, are densely packed, uh, con they're controversial, uh, and that they have to be dealt with with a sensitivity that, uh, that also merits a great city like Durham, uh, and in a way that brings our police department along with us in seeking to make them a better partner in the life of our community. But I just hope that you'll remember as we go through this period of 60 days of review and deliberation and, and consideration uh, that these racial disparities are real. They exist today, not in some hypothetical future. They exist now. And every day that we continue to debate these issues, those disparities will continue. Real people are harmed. Let's begin to heal our city. Thank you. Okay, I think that concludes all the persons that had asked to speak on this particular item. Uh, the matter is now back before the council. I'm going to recognize Councilman Brown, who had some comments before we went to the public comments. I support the city manager's letter. Okay. In that case, for the record, I entertain a motion to accept the city manager's uh, report. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Okay. Any other items come before the council tonight? If not, we're adjourned at 9.39 p.m. Thank you.